for this edition of Spotlight, since it's Arts Month, I have with me, well, as usual, Clinton Palanca and Manolo Quezon. Hi. Hello. Who will be introducing our guest? Well, I think it's very interesting that instead of the usual snooze fest about very highfalutin stuff about art, we have a detective story. And Matthew, you've been, well, most people would know you from sites on Facebook or Facebook groups such as Manila Nostalgia uh, and places like that where people, you know, exchange information. But I think you should walk our listeners through this detective story that, that, that you came across. First of all, um, thank you for having me here. Um, my delve in um, Philippine art and um, this discovery, uh, quote unquote, um, uh, was very random. Uh, it all started, um, I think, was having coffee, 6 p.m. and Normally in these websites, in these group pages, they'll just post old photos of Manila, occasionally some paintings, and I would contribute to this group. And then one of the admins of um, this um, group site posted a painting of uh, Hidalgo. Um, I've seen that painting, and that painting was offered at, I believe it was Salcedo Auctions. It was during last year. And Salcedo auctions for, for our listeners who aren't too familiar with these things, I mean, you know, with great art comes great opportunities for making money. And uh, I think it would be fair to say that over the past few years, there's been a big boom in the art auction market. That's correct. Um, we have, we don't not only have Salcedo auctions, we have Leon Gallery, we have dealers, galleries, and um, even the prestigious auction houses like S Sotheby's and Christie's. They're coming. They're now coming to the Philippines because it is the place for art. And it does not. And it's actually important to note that with a booming economy, people have money to spend right now for art. So, and the prices have gone just skyrocketed. So, um, um, back to. But by, by that, do you mean there are actually Sotheby's and Christie's auctions happening? Oh, no, no. I mean to say that these international houses, these auction houses, they're coming to Manila now, sourcing Philippine art, and placing them as a premium in their Southeast Asian modern contemporary art sales. Which means basically that the world is, is tuning into Philippine yes. art and, and finally um, recognizing its... Uh, I believe the most expensive Philippine art painting right now is, I believe, a Luna, España in Filipinas, which is now uh, exhibited at the National Gallery Singapore. And Philippine art has been getting the raves for the past few years, so more than... It's not... We think of Philippine art as a more of an insular thing, but now it's like widespread. You know? So if you go to Singapore, you go to Thailand, um, a Philippine artwork would probably in probably in a Singaporean or Thai collection already. So it's very valuable. And among the in the sort of the roster of, of superstars in in the, in the among our 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 artists, then of course the. They, they're the ones we see in the National Museum, and Luna, uh, Hidalgo, Amor Solo, Ben Cabin, and these others. So, okay, going back to your, your detective story, you see this picture of an Hidalgo painting that's up for auction? It was sold. So it had been sold. It had been sold. Okay. It had been sold. And um, I, I was reported it was paid for quite an, a substantial sum. But um, then I found out from my friend that uh, the painting was not sold, so basically. So there was a lack of a mismatch right there. But, but um, I'm not going to delve into those things, basically. So I just put it, say, oh, it probably was a painting offered. Was, no one wanted to buy it, so okay. So um, this lovely lady on Manila Style just posts this photo and basically and gets a lot of comments. What was it a painting of? I mean, let's visualize this thing. It's just a painting of a... She looked like a doll. It was a girl. 
And purportedly, it came from a influential Spanish Philip Mestizo family back in Spain and had this Hidalgo for generations. So, you know, typical provenance. It, it had the air of truth to it. So, you know, you can be, you can find it's like, oh, this is normal. I mean, like a Luna last year came up for auction, came from um, the same source. So I'm guessing um, it can probably came from the same source or from another source in a European collection somewhere. And then wanted to bring back to the Philippines because, you know, it's worth more here. So posted, commented, and then uh, one guy just said, Are you sure this is a Hidalgo? He just commented. And then I was thinking, like, why would he question that? So I did the research and then I sent the, a, a still to. Um, Ambeto Campo, noted Philippine historian and expert on Luna and Hidalgo. And I asked him for a second opinion. And um, although my training is more on uh, modern, like Amor Solo onwards, um, I have, um, he would be the go to guy for old masters. So I asked him for a second opinion and he told me, this looks odd. But you might as well look into it. Why? Why did he say it looks odd? Because um, it had the air. It looked like a Hidalgo was signed a Hidalgo. But it does not feel to be a Hidalgo. So when he means by he feels, he, I already suspected there was something wrong with this painting. In art connoisseurship, when you feel something that is wrong, Turns out it's actually true that it, the thing is actually a forgery. And true enough, I believe it was Ben Ramos that I would like to give him credit here that he did a Google search of that painting and then we found out that this painting was sold as a Belgian painting all the way back in France for like a quarter or like 125th of the value of a Hidalgo painting. So it turns out this is an actual forgery. And um, I'm pretty sure Salcedo had some minders inside those, for those groups, probably trying to source from all old families, found out, and then they were stunned. And I believe they, I believe they were able to send a message to Salcedo. Um, I only broke this story when Salcedo gave the official statement because when you especially especially in the art market you have to be very careful because you know libel suits and whatnot so I had to wait for the official statement to come out and then true enough a leading Philippine auction house had to withdraw a painting and turn and even acknowledge its fault this is for me a very uh important thing because you have a leading philippine auction house withdrawing a painting which it cataloged as a hidalgo and tried to sell as a hidalgo refrain and basically accepting responsibility which is both a good thing but in the mind of these uh mind of the dealers and probably the collectors and they they lost face I mean, a Hidalgo is what, 50, 60 million, maybe 100 million pesos right now? You but lost your thing. <laughs> zeroing back in the painting for a second, I mean, you're saying that actually it's a painting by a European artist. That's correct. And Leon it Herbo had been, artist. excuse me? Leon Herbo was the guy. Okay, who, who is a minor artist. Very minor. Okay, very minor. So someone essentially my guess is bought it bought it in france for a few thousand euros and then probably um removed the name herbo and just painted it over it with the nearest looking paint to it and then affixed the signature of hidalgo so to purport and um which is so quite, it's, it went beyond just changing the signature. I mean, there was even an inscription that says a mi querida something like to my daughter in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I believe the, the supposedly it was painted as um, it was called portrait of a 
girl or lady in Paris. But when it went here, it was given the name portrait of Anna Maria Gonzalez, which I, I, which was apparently linked to some famous Ilustrado family in the Philippines. And then that's where it came from, you know, it came from the family, so on and so forth. And when, and which is quite strange because modern pigment is easy to detect with just, you know, scan of the, with an x-ray machine, basically. You can detect once the painting was, when there's like an old painting, and there's, you can detect new layers of underpaint, basically. So, and the, the, thing that was that disgusted me is that you know the person really tried to remove all traces of its previous life as a leon herbo to be purported as a hitam. how well you would again this this i mean you have to visualize it people have not seen this painting so again did you get a painting and add to it and modify it or just fiddle around with it by erasing the signature and putting it's it not, in it. Um, I mean, it was a whole scale thing because the original painting was like brown, brownish green, which has faded over time. And then when it came in the catalog, it was like bright yellow and bright cream. So this person probably painted, overpainted the, the back of the brownish part and um, affixed the inscription and the signature and if you very look at it and like the signature basically was very precise and pristine that says R Hidalgo year etc okay which now brings us to the question of how do you figure out something is a fake I mean you know there's there's a debate always about it doesn't feel like an Hidalgo. That's the connoisseur talking, right? That That's you've correct. studied it so much you get a sixth sense. That's right. But if you're looking at all the other documentary stuff that's done now, there's a little science that goes into it as that's well. Correct. So what's the marriage between the two? Walk us through how once you have a hunch, how did people proceed to figure out that this was a, a fake? Which also brings up the question, how did it get through and be thought of as not a fake? That's the bigger question, I believe, Manolo, because if you if this fake passed through a, a prestigious auction house without being detected at first glance, that is already a bad that's already a that's already a bad that's already a disturbing sign for an auction house basically that the fake was able to push through. Well, I mean let's not be too harsh. It could be that it was just a very good fake. That's so true. walk us through the process. Let's let's do this so scientifically. We'll, let's if we're going to do it scientifically, um, of course, documentation is very important. Provenance. So where did the painting came from? A, a, a list of history of previous owners. Um, that, for me, is the first step. The second step is the actual painting itself. The painting could say 1895, but could just be 1995. So you must um, undergo like x-ray studies, um, look at the crackalures or you know the chips of the painting basically. An old 19th century master would have cracks that you that a modern forger cannot easily replicate. And um, you know ink pigments, you know ink, um, ink pigments that were only used in the 19th century. Uh, and then this is what I learned. Um, sadly, we don't have it in the Philippines, but I wish we did. Um, some use um, carbon dating mm -hmm. to check out the pigments, you know, to check, to find out the canvas. But the one the thing that I find is um, very uh, important is the infrared technology. Because if you, you can have, see the layers. Because you can see the layers. You can see the stages of the painting when it was produced. Um, I believe about two or three years ago, um, the Louvre did an amazing project of doing an infrared um, image of the Mona Lisa. And they looked at the stages of the Mona Lisa from, from its inception up to its present thing. And um, which for me is if it's the best way to check at tracing the narrative of the painting of how it lived through life. So, but um, in our context, I would say that 
X-rays would be a very good option, basically, because you can check under paint. Infrared, black light technology is also a good thing. Um, these are things that can easily be accessed um, in a, in a university laboratory. Do we, do we have this sort yes, of CSI? I, CSI I know it sounds very CSI, but um, the National Museum has been doing um, a lot of uh, radio carbon. I can't pronounce it properly, but they're doing a lot of um, testing, scientific testing on these paintings, basically. So we do have the equipment. Uh, we have the equipment. It does exist. I, yeah, University of the Philippines is the one who's doing it. So, uh, with the National Museum, actually, the National Museum right now is trying to create a database of artists and artworks existent uh, within its permanent collection, to um, so that, um, like I said, we have a law. Actually, I want to talk about that because this is the funny thing. Um, there is a law in our country that actually considers art forgery as a crime. Okay. And in one of the provisions of that law, there must be an authentication panel that will determine a committee, a committee of scholars and experts will determine whether an artwork is of, of real or fake. And then it is their certification that will, uh, which can be used by dealers and by collectors. I say, okay, I have a genuine Amor Solo, I have a genuine Ben Cab, so on and so forth. But the problem is that has not yet been fully implemented. What we have in the interim are non profit organizations that are basically composed of certain artists and very few I believe the Amor Solo Foundation, the Ben Gab Foundation, uh, Fundacion Sanso for these paintings but but isn't it a little <coughs> little more primitive than that because and here correct me if I'm wrong I mean in in the Amor Solos it's basically the daughter of Amor Solo saying that's my dad that's not my dad yes okay so it's not very Complicated. It's not very complicated. For um, for some of these others, it would be along similar lines. Well, um, I believe, well, not all. I think the best example would be the Ben Cab Foundation because it's a full committee. And it really helps because the artist is still alive. Uh, but you have, um, you have scholars, you have academics, you have artists who know the artist very well, that they can detect whether it's a real bank or not, even without the consent of the artist. Of course, you know, the, the artist can be always be consulted. Um, but there are cases the artist can be wrong. So um, I'll give you, this is, a, this, a, this is a very interesting fact. Um, if you, you know how artists are, you know, when they hate their artwork, they will tend to destroy it. But if that artwork was given and you have, for example, the artist had a feud with this person and then you were the artist and that painting was sold, you can just say, oh, that's a forgery and uh, blah, 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 blah. But the interesting thing was that um, this is a good case we can talk about. Um, back in the 70s, um, the late British painter Lucian Freud, well, he's a... Yeah, yeah, Lucian Freud, yeah. So he had to, he had a fight with a, he had a fight with a paint, with a fellow painter who owned his artwork, a basket of fruit, and then he just told him, hey, that is not a real painting, that is not mine. And all of their letters were collected, and then when the painting, with all those documentation that he even, he said that that is not real, it was sold as a genuine work. Okay. But it was, um, but that is why um, it's very important that as early even as the painter is alive or the artist is alive, a consistent compendium of work should be published. And that's, I think we can talk about the catalog raisonné here. That's a very fancy term. What, what does it mean? A catalog raisonné is basically a compendium. It's like the Bible of all known artworks of a painting, of painting, artwork, sketches, drawings of an artist when they live. And if you were an auction dealer and you hunted and you had a painting or a sketch that wanted to be, uh, to be sold, you just cross-reference it with this database 
And then if it isn't the database, you sell it, it's a genuine, and you don't get fooled. Mm-hmm. The, it is a standard international practice from Picasso to Da Vinci, Rothko, you can, they have these databases. The problem is in the Philippines, we don't have that database. For any of, even the major artists. Even, this is even surprising. Um, what we only have in the rig are basically um, glossy prints of art books that talk about, okay, this dimension, the size, what collection it is, but doesn't have like, say, from which provenance so and so and forth, which is how an actual raisin is supposed to be. And uh, it's a complete, when I, or nearly complete. My, my understanding was in the past. I mean, many of these books were put together in the 70s and the 80s, and you had cases where, for example, the, um, you know, a, a painting is an asset, and it's worth a lot of money. And if you reveal you have the painting, you could be... You know, you could be uh, held up or something. And so there's a bit of politics in, in all of this as well, right? So basically, in the past, people wanted to... Basically, if your painting came out in the book, it's proof that it exists, right? So it's in your interest to have your painting. Let's say you have a painting and, and it comes out in, in, in one of Ding Rosas's books. That's like a certificate that it's real. That is correct. But you don't want to put your name because but it also someone means that you have it in your house. Yes, and the BIR may not, you know, may, may take interest. That, that is true, but we live in an age that that that's the problem though. Because even if you have these art books, chances are like even if you yourself, the collector, uh, publish a book of all known drawings, um you could never be that complete. You can never be that complete, and you would not even know whether this work is genuine or not. With a catalog resonate, a database, you can cross-reference all known styles, all known techniques, are made by the artist. So even, for example, if this is always happens the case, um, if there would be one Luna sketch, the uh, being sold up for auction and then it came up correctly with something that was next to it which is almost the same style chances are they're probably brothers probably they would be of the same time same time frame but the problem is we don't have that database so it makes dealers and art historians like me and art researchers out there a hard time to find to check to determine. But it's a great gray area for the faker and the forger and the... If you want to use the analogy of the smoke screen, the lack of um, a catalog raising a database is the perfect smoke screen for a fake to just pass through the art market. And all it just takes basically um, getting a as in this case, a 19th century painting, and just put the name Hidalgo and just change the backing. So, so you're basically saying that because the market has gotten so big and so credible all over the world, people have to step up their game and make it really start applying international standards. That is, that's what you're saying. That is correct. I mean, you can't... Um, you can't just like think that, oh, the Philippine art market is way different. No, it's not. It's just a normal art market. Um, it, in, it does not help that prices have gone so high that normal artworks are, cannot, be in the, um, cannot be afforded by some people and only the wealthy or like, you know, those But they also have a vested interest that they're getting their money's worth. They that, have to. Not- they have to, and I believe it is the interest of collectors, especially um, you know, those who want to enter the art market now, that you have to step, you need to do your research, you need to do your due diligence. I mean, like, if you can do due diligence of, like, ascertaining, like, whether your Rolex is genuine or not, you might as well do the same thing for your Ben Cab or your Ireneo Miranda or what have you. But, but the impression I'm getting from you is that 
there is beginning to be this cooperation yes. among both among private individuals, scholars, and institutions such as the National Museum. That's correct. Can okay, I, so can I press you on um, on the topic of fake, who who is the most forged uh, Philippine painter? That is actually the interesting question, but I believe Fernando Amorsolo would be the most fake, not because of the lack of documentation. On the contrary, um, the, the great thing with, uh, with Mrs. Silvia Amorsolo Lazo, the daughter of the master, is that the master kept paintings, uh, kept pictures and drawings. Oh, he did. So it's not just her going, oh, that looks like that he made it. Because it's, she has it's a, document. a little more scientific. There's more document. I mean, that's a, and it's, a, it's a great thing. I mean, that, you know, the artists themselves took a photo. Mm -hmm. And um, actually what Amorsolo would do if you were an American tourist, you would go to his house, pick up an album, say which one you wanted, you pick it. Amorsolo would just paint for you and just pick up the painting the next day. And each painting was photograph basically in the style so there is a sort of cross-reference which is but still like I said a catalog raising is the best thing but yes he is the most faked artist because of the volume of work he did and uh, this is just hearsay that uh, I came across during research for an article but then uh, someone said that actually in all probability more than half of what are supposed to be Amor Solos in private collections are actually fakes. And one of the reasons why people don't want to put out a catalog is that they, they have this painting that they've told all their friends, I have an Amor Solo. Then they actually took it to, uh, for, for the CSI forensics, discovered that it wasn't an Amor Solo. And then they carefully put it back on their wall and said, well, <laughs> <laughs> So, well, I, I mean, that, that, that could be another possibility, why this catalog doesn't exist. It, that could be the case. Um, but, you know, if you want a Philippine art market to survive and thrive, you have, there needs to be some, there needs to be some hard boots in the ground. And then there needs to be a definite expert or book that determines whether or not this painting is a forgery or not. I mean, Matthew, that brings us back to your your painting of the girl yeah. that was claimed to be yeah. by Hidalgo. Yeah. Because since there was no um, catalog raisonné, that's correct. Since afterwards, when by by what you're telling us, when people started poking around with the painting, it became very clearly a fake. You still need to walk us through. How did it start reaching the point where people decided to more actively start poking at the painting? And the very interesting story, to their credit, regardless of whether a mistake was made in the beginning, that the, the gallery did admit to its error. So something must have come to the, together to make it so beyond debate that it was a fake. I'm pretty sure um, when when eyes and ears came and looking at this painting came along, uh, I believe one of the commenters himself wrote a letter to the auction house and asking, uh, I have some concern on the painting that was being sold. I just want to know more about information about the painting. And I believe that this, that I don't know how. But a few days later, after as what my fr as this commenter later told me, a few days later the official statement came out. So I'm pretty sure that's how it all the whole ball started mm -hmm. basically. But um, for me that was a breakthrough because you had you did not have scholars, <laughs> mind you, you didn't have scholars who were questioning whether the painting was fake. You had normally normal. Uh, you know, cultural histor cultural activists, you know, people who don't know much about art history or um, art connoisseurship for that matter, just poking, um, under trying to poke and see this is not right, this is, this is false. Which is a, for me, is a, a way to understand that, you know, art education art history for that matter should not just be confined in a classroom or just with some body of experts. 
it should be taught. I mean, one of the things that I would um, like to say that if you know, if you were, if you can determine whether it uh, the difference between a Coke and a Pepsi, and as early as a kid, you would can uh, you can apply the same principle on whether you know what is a Luna, what's a Hidalgo, what is genuine, what is not. So you're saying it's unusual that it was done by laymen, in other words. Um, who would usually be the authenticators? I mean, are there... Well, historians are basically... Art historians. These are the authorities. These are the authorities, basically. But even amongst them, there is contention and debate, which is always the case. Um, but... Is there ever bribery? I mean... I won't say... I won't... I cannot ascertain to that measure on like whether there is a little bit of politicking going on here and there. But what I could say is this. Um, when you have a growing economy like ours right now, and you have a, you know, you have, there's a lot of people, and artworks are coming here and out of anywhere, you have to be very careful what comes out on the market. So Matthew, you're saying we don't know what the procedure of the gallery was to determine if the painting was genuine or not in the first place? This is my guess. This is an intelligent hypothesis. The gallery um, was offered a Hidalgo, probably had documentation, papers, that said it was a Hidalgo. And then a historian or an art expert, whoever that was, was asked to look at this painting to see if it was genuine. And this this expert said this was a genuine Hidalgo and said, okay, that's a seal of approval we need. We'll sell it, basically. So along that time, um, there would be, I just, um, well, it was stated that they did a technical ana analysis on the painting, but a technical analysis should have already stated as early as done, which was, uh, modern pigment or what was different and I think it's been important to do a inter an internet search of the previous provenance of the painting so documentation and technical analysis in this case failed on the part of uh, who was handling the sale so my suggestion is that when a painting comes up you gotta know where it really came from, basically. If you know it came from like a prestigious collection, a prestigious collector, chances are the, especially a very old collection, you have an understanding and you have an idea, okay, this is possibly a genuine work. But let me, let me challenge you here. There's, there's a, there's still an underlying level. What the, the sort of main level here is really people who are, steeped in it, who, you know, who are connoisseurs, just the whole word of, of being a connoisseur is that you've, you've just imbibed so much art that you're sweating it out your pores. But in the end, um, and of course the antidote to that is you may be intellectually convinced, but if you look at the pigment and it was made in, it has, it has plastic in it, it couldn't have been made by Hidalgo. So, but then that can be fake too. I mean, um, What's the name of there's th there's this guy who was uh, uh, locked up in Holland after World War Two for selling paintings to the Nazis. Ah, the Van Meter and Yeah, I mean, can you walk us through? I think this is a very good because he fooled everyone. He fooled the technical people and he fooled the connoisseurs. Um. So a little bit background. Hans Van Meeren was. Um, a failed Dutch artist. He wanted to be a modern artist like Mondrian, but he failed at it. So he decided, okay, I can't make money as a real painter. I might as well forge paintings. So he decided to forge Vermeer's, Rembrandt's, Franz Hals, and then would sell them to unsuspecting dealers. And surprisingly, even the Dutch state museums in The Hague were even fooled by him. One case, I think you mentioned it, that um, one of his fakes ended up with uh, Hermann Goering, um, the notorious Nazi plunderer. And when they found out that Meheren sold a Vermeer, and it was accepted as a Vermeer, by the, mind you, um, 
they, um, he was charged of uh, state theft. So Van Meijeren basic, and at that time, if you were selling a cultural object in Holland, you get the death penalty, especially if you sold it to the Nazis. But um, Van Meijeren knows he was a fake. He knows it was a forgery because he painted that. He showed to the judge and even painted in front of the judge they actually showed them the actual pigments, the actual brushes he used, and even how he took a old 17th, 15th, 16th century painting, used it, removed the old paint. And like, painted. sort of like what this guy did with this Hidalgo, whoever he is. I'm pretty sure, but the thing was, compared to the Van Meijeren case, the Van Meijeren case was that you had unknown Vermeers, which we don't know from God knows where just ended up and just being sold for tons of money and then it took the artist who was already caught and convicted to determine like okay i'm sorry these were paintings that were done by me um fun fact it is not known how many van meherens are out in the market right now and we do are and museums are still grappling with the chaos that he left um in their case of the hidalgo was not as grand so is there a Filipino Van Meijeren? Is there some criminal genius out there with a shop in Quiapo somewhere? Well, um, back in the 80s, back in the 80s, in, uh, I believe it was in Mabini Street, um, struggling Filipino artists would just paint reproductions of Amor Solos. And, and these were legitimate copies and replicas, basically. You know, they were selling them for like 20, 50 pesos. Um, I believe there was a th paper done just recently at the University of the Philippines that stated that one of these Mabini artists was just asked by some criminal underworld basically, I want you to become a forger. And he forged dozens of Amor Solos here and there. And then, but then he got caught. And we don't even know his name. We don't even know how he was. But um, as always the case, these are like stories that are never told. And we don't know how many uh, of his works correct. were not caught. And the problem though is that, um, and this is a very, not even sad thing, this is a terrible thing, is that the, end, the guy ended up dead. So it's a very dark world out there. So you... Um, Delving and you you think like it's you you don't you know, people think especially in Hollywood movies oh art forgery like the Thomas Crown Affair or James Bond you know it's a very glamorous thing especially with the art market but it's not it can be a life or death situation I mean think of yourself even if you are the forger and you are forging a number solo and you're just being paid for like one tenth. Or not even like a decimal percent of what it uh, was being sold to a rich collector. He is not benefiting, basically. Great rewards come along, but there's also great risk. So, like you know, investing in the stock market, you think it's you think you are gonna make a good purchase with this thing, and you always take a bet. The art market is for me. I suggest if for people who are investors and collectors, it's like a casino. You just want to make a bet on what's the next big thing or you want to find that gold that golden goose that's gonna lay your golden egg and with that blind side you can actually forget to know differences distinguish and you actually will be caught up into it which i think we should say okay you have you have to stick you have to take a back seat first and second okay i want to enter it but i need to be sure it's okay to take a second opinion, a third opinion, even a fourth opinion for that matter, because it's a good thing. You know what's missing in all of this? Don't you have to love the painting first? Not really. Really? <laughs> Not really. Well, I, for me, for me, um, I myself am an art collector myself. Not a big one, but I'm an art collector myself. And I appreciate um, artworks that speaks to me. And um, they don't need to be as they could they could be as small as ten twenty thousand pesos. Very reasonable for an affluent person, a young yuppie like me. But for especially the old collectors, the old connoisseurs and um, old money gated community guys, they um they have to they take gamble, 
And some people, sadly, the thing that I don't like about is that they're willing to, they would pay for a artist, which I consider as brands. And they were, they would forget the aesthetics, basically. And, you know, especially in a booming art market, you know, if you have a Zobel compared to an Antonio Austria, um, who is underrated, they're both quality pieces, but what will be more, what will be placed on the front page of the catalog, what will be placed on center stage in the auction will be the Zobel. And um, you, it, you lose, you, it makes you feel kind of sad, basically. So... Um, I'm kind of glad right now we have this trend in the Philippine art scene that you know we have artists that are forgotten that are actually getting their dues now and they're getting their best work even though they have passed on or they're now at their later stage but and I believe you know those underrated artists will not will be the subject of a massive forgery scandal right there but what are be affected will be those brands Brands like Zobel, brands like Bencab, brands like Luna and Hidalgo, or even even like Damian Domingo, if you heard about him. Those are brands that people want to buy in. And they don't think of art as a measure of prestige or wealth. They see it as an investment. And like an investor, you want to make money out of it. So chances are they won't care what the painting is or was. If it just says Aluna, I will buy it, basically. To summarize, I suppose I wanted to ask also, what's th for people who are just, you know, who maybe didn't develop their appreciation for art until recently and want to get into it? Aside from the research, what are the other steps they can take to ensure that what they're buying is real? Are there people they can approach? Are there experts that they can ask? Yeah, there are a lot of... There's a lot of experts like Ambeth Ocampo, Patrick Flores. It actually helps if you can contact the artists themselves, if there's the living. And because especially now, um, Benka, for example, who can ascertain that this is a genuine work or not. So, um, but if the, as most of the cases, the artists have passed on, um, experts, books, um, monographs, I think the best ones would be Ayala Museum's Filipina Heritage Library, the Lopez Museum and Library. The National Museum can actually help you authenticate work which they've been doing for quite some time. So there is, a, there is some people, people can just run to for help and to ascertain some things. And even some private galleries themselves that were tasked and uh, given authority by the artists themselves to authenticate works actually it's a good way it, I, like I said it, you know without a catalog raisonne but my suggestion like I said a catalog raisonne can be something that even though a person can doesn't need to own it they can just go to the library and just seek out that uh, that seek out those documentation then they will ascertain okay this is a real genuine work so that's all I can say all right um, thank you for all of that expert insight and that very interesting mystery story. Um, join us again next week.